said. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much, Annie, um, for your introduction. And also, many thanks to those of you who have come this evening. Um, it was extremely good of you in such a terrible night to, to uh, make it uh, here, and I appreciate that. Um, just by way of beginning, um, I did originally give this talk the title The Wide Margins of Photographic History, but as I started working on it, I got the feeling that it might be nearer to stick fighting in Paisley. And at the end of this evening, I'll show you a photograph of stick fighting in Paisley in the 1880s. And that's partly because I realised as I was writing it that I wanted to raise some questions about why history matters. And, and also because it's the shop annual lecture as well, which looks at the history of photography in Scotland. I wanted to bring in some of those ideas. And so just while we have this image up here, I'm just going to leave this up for a minute or two while I do a little bit of an introduction. Um, really to just get you thinking about the business of looking. And it's a useful way of, as you can see here with all the hands that are interfering in this uh, drawing, of the way in which our, our vision gets very fixed. I always just think it's a nice way of thinking about, we don't need the hands, the clamps, any of that any longer. But that idea that there are wide margins is enormously important. Okay? So margins have always interested me in all sorts of ways. They're there for being written on in books. In terms of photographic history, those margins have grown and grown. And that can only be a good thing. And in many ways, I would like to see, I think I would say, the centre implode altogether, because it can only benefit us all. So increasingly, as I want to show you this evening, I think photographic history has been reshaped by debates outside its discipline, um, by telling history from the bottom up, telling history from the inside out. And it's made us aware that we too all have history. So I want to raise some of those important questions that I think there is about you know, really that question of what it is to be in the margin. I think the other thing I wanted to do was just bring in a number of, of kind of snapshots almost of um, dates. And I'm going to start really at 1839, and I'm going to kind of end up at the present. But the way I'm going to do that, when I kind of was trying to work out a timeline, and I won't put up any timelines because they're kind of boring to look at, um, but I, I'm thinking of it in this way, 1839, 100 years later, you've got 1939, 50 years later, 89, and then 25 years later, you're up to 2014. And I think that probably tells us quite a lot about the way in which time and space has become compressed in that period as well. Those first 100 years are quite long, but since then, it's kind of speeded up a bit. So those are the, you'll see as I go through, those are the kind of um, debates that I, uh, I, I want to bring up. Um, so, as I say, just, this is just a way of starting of thinking of how we're encouraged to look straight down the middle, right between the eyes, you might almost say as well, as things quite often come to us in that way, and what happens once we start to look slightly differently. Um, oops, this seems to have frozen now. Hmm. Sorry if you just give me a minute. got the wheel of taunt on the screen. <laughs> Um, probably because it's been lying sleeping for a while. Okay. Right, let's see if we... Hmm. No. Okay, well, the best, the best leads, lead plans. My, uh, I've still got the wheel of taunt. Has it just gone to sleep? Yeah, I'll probably just take a leap over. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. okay, so I don't know how well people can see this print, given they might light. Um, whoops, seems to have gone... Uh, hang on, seems to have taken on a, a life of its own. Uh, hang on, just go back. There we go. Um, this is a well-known print. It appeared in December 1839, and it's a French print of a cartoon of uh, the invention of photography. As I say, I, I don't know how, if you're at the back, you might have trouble seeing it, but if you can't see all of it, go on and have a look at it. And it's fascinated me for a long time for a number of reasons. 
And I want to just bring up one or two of those really this evening. One of the things is the way in which uh, right at the centre you have the camera. Okay, so you have Daguerre, the Daguerre's camera right in the centre. And you can see the way in which the people kind of come through it, the way in which um, there's cameras up, up in the sky, so the view from above, the way in which down at the bottom you have people kind of dragging, pulling, pushing from all angles. Steamships are taking it, trains are carrying it, and of you that sense, if you were to think beyond the edge of this image, of the fact that cameras are going to go everywhere. They're going to go global. There is no question of that. And I think the other thing that um, has always interested me in it is really what would lie off to either side of this. And one of the useful things it does on this far side here on the left is it shows us the way in which um, kind of popular entertainment is part of uh, the camera as well. And on the very far side of the right, you will see that it says the system uh, do Dr. Donny, D Dr. Donny's system, which he produced with Foucault, which was uh, microscopy. Okay, so the use of daguerreotypes for photomicroscopy. And the thing also I think about that as well is that it's useful to think about is there isn't really much point then, presumably, even more so now, of separating out high culture from mass culture. There's not much point in separating out science from art. Um, photography is all those things and right from the moment of invention in a way Morisset who did very little work after this in fact predicts what's going to happen this would tell you absolutely um, everything you needed to know and of course with its title of daguerreotype mania it's, a it, it's really a type of industrial madness and that madness has continued I'm going to come back to that at the end again one or two other things in it. There's all sorts of ways you could go. The fact is the printmakers, um, the engravers have hung themselves in the gallows. They're not going to be needed. They're out of a job. You know, that kind of feeling too. Um, you have in the centre of it, you have the umbrella above the uh, camera, right in the middle. I think it's important that that's in the middle. And the umbrella's always fascinated me. And what, uh, what, what I do know about that now is that um, Casal who invented lots of um, it, it, clever improvements in umbrellas, patented a number of them in 1839. And actually what he invented was a spring. He was interested in things like how you didn't get your sleeve caught as you tried to put up the umbrella, and then a spring so that, as he said, it would open itself. So those technical things are also part of it. And last but not least, in the little shop that is here, the building, you've got the Zeus brothers. And the Zeus brothers were quite simply, um, they were originally paper makers, and then they went into fancy goods, and they had their shop in the panoramas of um, the little kind of arcades, the panorama arcade in Paris. And they gradually got better and better and wealthier, and ended up actually doing casting. So they did um, bronze casting. So that kind of history of the way in which photography appears, first of all, really at, in a fancy goods shop, I think is probably quite important as well and is linked to that. And the other things are things like, um, not just umbrellas, the lighting. You have the introduction, which is going to come, of gas lighting, better ways of seeing. And so those all become part of the story. And of course, here you have uh, copies returned within 13 minutes. Well, we now know that, you know, it's that speeded up. But it was the same kind of thing then. 13 minutes was nothing in 1839. So this kind of industrialization, I think, is really important to understanding photography. And last but not least, the ground is cleared. Okay? There's not a building in sight apart from the Zeus Brothers shop. Okay? There's just nothing else there. So you have that kind of way in which the city is going to be rebuilt. And this happens, of course, all over Europe. Okay, so in terms of just placing that within context as well. This is in fact just the front page of the caricature which is the magazine in which it, it appeared, which the Morissette cartoon appeared. And uh, there you have the, the page, which if you, it's very faint, I can see there, because there's not enough dim light. But this is the, the little section on the daguerreotype that appeared in December 1839 as well. My only reason really for putting this in is that photography belongs to the page. Okay, it's always been belonged to that. I think it's been privileged otherwise. 
but it really has always been tied to words, information, right from the start as well. So. <coughs> my apologies, I seem to have the wheel of taunt. I don't know if it's my, okay, here we are. Right, just stop there for a minute. So, the canvas that were made for the Zeus brothers were lost until about 10 years ago when one was discovered. And I, part, I put this in just to show the size of it, the black box. And I want you to think as we go through about the way that that's been condensed as well. But when it was discovered, one of the things was the realisation that it was made of cheaper wood, thinner wood, um, and that it could be sold at a cheaper price. So it's all about undercutting right from the start as well. It was 50 francs less. Um, than Jura's camera. So that, that's important too. And it was importantly authenticated as well by um, Daguerre. So you had on it, whoops, go back a minute. Um, so you have on it a little stamp that you saw at the side, and with, as you can see very prominently, Zeus Frere's uh, name on it as well. Okay. So the types of images that are produced from that, of course, as we, as we all know, are the view that Daguerre takes um, from his diorama, from his own uh, you know, sort of perspective of streets, the earliest photographs that are produced. We know that those stories are well uh, covered. We know about the way in which plans appear for the restructuring of um, Paris, and shops move around, people move around. We know that the diorama of Daguerre burns down. We know that that's when he uh, invents photography. We also know that at the same time as you've got the industrial madness, there are things like crazies for tortoises in Paris in 1839 as well. Now, many of those things might not seem important, but they probably tell us quite a lot about what's going on. And when we put photography within this wider context as well, you can see again in those images what's above, what's below. Those also appeared in the magazine La Caricature, or in this image here of uh, the miseries of poor people. So again, you get this in any European city. You get very quickly, just move on to Nadar, quite literally, you go up in the balloon, you're taking the shots that Maurice says, says is going to come. And you also get Nadar doing the reverse of that, moving into the, um, the sewers and the um, catacombs of Paris as well. And we know that the figures, of course, were, were because of long exposure times, are, um, you know, w he used wax figures in order to just actually be able to make those shots. But I think what's important there is that view from above, but also structurally what's going on under the city. Okay. So in a sense, all I'm doing here, as you can probably see, is the way in which you can build a little sort of story around what's at the edges of Morris's print. And so in this image here, this is in fact um, a picture of probably the inspiration for the tightroper in Morisset's cartoon. This is uh, Madame Saki. And here you have, once you start to look for, well, where, where did you get those ideas of photography appearing in fairgrounds as well? And you find those books uh, in, in various books, you find prints. Um, this is, in fact, very similar to the one in the Morisot, Morisot, and you find, in fact, pictures of Madame Saki herself in later life, this one is. Um, and so you begin to see that, that that way of popular entertainment becomes important. And similarly, also, here, um, the images of, as you can see, the daguerreotype photomicrographs. So here you have a page of those of Donnie and Foucault's system. So once we start to build this around, you get a very different image. And that might make us think a little differently when we go back to the image here. Here's a coloured uh, colored print of it. So it comes to life a bit more than black and white, and that's going to become important. So one of the things that I really, um, I suppose I'm trying to sketch in here, is the way that you would need to think beyond a frame. You always need to think beyond a frame. Don't always be just pushed into the middle where you're thinking, OK, the camera photography is at the centre of everything. It both is and isn't. And really, this is a much longer history of looking. That's what the Morris says about. And in this little image here, which many of you might have seen before, this is actually a picture of um, 
uh, Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, um, his, his sig sort of um, signet almost, that he had designed by Willie Reveley. And you can see, if you're not too far back, that along it is mercy, justice, and in big letters, vigilance. Okay, so those three terms. And really, of course, what that would suggest to us, if you think about that in the 1780s into the 19th century, is the way in which it's a much longer system of looking. So at the centre of this, you have an, the eye as well, the all-seeing eye. And that kind of starts, I think, to make sense of the introduction of lighting. This is um, in Paris, the Place uh, de la Concorde, and of improved lighting, in, in, again, in making it safer, um, all the things that are uh, introduced to us, or indeed in this kind of image um, here, which is, and, I'm, and we're just going to pause here for a moment, this is the Gorgon stair, which is a more up-to-date um, view of, I suppose, mercy, justice and vigilance as well. So one of the reasons uh, I wanted to kind of bring those images together, and I'm just, as I say, I'll just pause there for a minute, is the way in which you could say that over the last um, 25 years, really you have had quite a lot of uh, changes taking place. So I'm going to come and go a little bit here and just say, there is absolutely no doubt that um, in the kind of, uh, I suppose, say the last 25, 30 years, that photography has come of age within the museum, within galleries and the academy. And those have largely been devoted to a sort of high modernist with a very capital M, fascination with authorship. I'm less interested in that, and I'll come on to the reasons for that at the end. And of course, the other way that um, discussion has gone is, in a sense, the wonders of technological progress. And so we could say that for sure photography has arrived. It did overturn the judgment seat of art, and the museum is definitely not in ruins, far from it. But in its turn, photography has been absorbed into the art establishment. And I want to question that. Because we now know that most photographs are, in fact, transient, ubiquitous, quotidian, um, ordinary, everyday in every sense. And there's no doubt that technology has extended our perception. This would suggest it uh, to us as well. But it, in, in very um, intimately related ways, it has also actually increased our subjection and subjugation. And that's the bit we're less interested in talking about. Um, because what we hear all the time is about the limitless possibilities of technology. Or we hear on a daily basis, a picture changes everything. And in fact, those are very comforting, but neither of them are true. Okay? So I think when we look at something like this image here, um, what we begin to see is the way in which and in contemporary digital mass culture, self-surveillance becomes enormously important and the body is spectacle. Those become very closely tied together. The self can very quickly become other and what we really have is a kind of heightened, I think, um, both narcissistic identification and also exhibitionism. Okay? Now this might seem a long way, just bear with me for a minute from this image. And I'll say a bit more about the Gorgon stair as well. But what really happens is that, our, our, I think out of that is that voyeurism itself, that sort of intense looking, becomes um, sharpened too. And we turn ourselves now through Facebook very willingly into um, commodities. Okay? We're only too happy to go on there, sell information about ourselves, only there's no wages for it. Okay? We do it because we want to. And in that sense, we could say that the invocation we receive is to look so that you may be looked at in return. Okay? People look so that they may be looked at in return. And one of the anxieties um, today would seem to be actually the prospect of not being exposed to the look of the other. Okay? Unlike, if you think of the panopticon, that idea of actually just... Uh, one person being able to see somebody else they're not seeing. Now that's almost reversed. Anxiety seems to arise from not being exposed to the other's gaze all the time and that we need that as some kind of guarantee of our being, of who we are. And when I was thinking about that as well, I was also thinking about the way in which um, some of you may have seen recently um, somebody live-streamed their, their partner giving birth. 
okay? And that, that, that idea of that everything has to be recorded all the time. And this is sometimes referred to pictures or it didn't happen. Okay, if there's not pictures, if there's not evidence, it didn't happen. And so that would extend to the very large number of, of images uploaded onto Facebook every day, whatever it is, three billion plus probably now, uh, sorry, three million plus, and also the way in which things like the Gorgon Stair um, is used as well. It has multiple real surveillance cameras. This isn't the, the latest model, but the latest one I noticed is something like 192 cameras installed in it. And it's actually attached to what are called reapers. You can see where the language comes from, the Gorgon Stare, you won't be looking back, and the idea of the Grim Reaper. And those are deadly drones, um, which in the, world, in the words of the um, US military, now we can see everything. Okay, now we can see everything. Instead of, they say, through the old view that they call, as you can see up there, uh, the old soda straw view. Okay, that idea that you can't see enough. All you do is you widen and widen and widen. <coughs> so that idea, I think, about the way in which vision is important historically to think through beyond what we see in pictures is because really what we have now is that um, everything becomes an event. And I want to argue at the end that this is not some kind of democratisation. And in fact, quite the reverse. As somebody like Sontag would have said more than 30 years ago now, um, something worth photographing is the definition of an event, but it is still ideology in its broadest sense that determines what constitutes that event. So I think those kind of ways of, of you know, kind of thinking about what gets to be photographed are, are worth thinking, as I say, beyond those frames, and maybe bringing some of those things uh, together. And so when we look, I'm going to have the same problem again when I try and move on to the next slide. When, when we look again historically about the reorganising, or in this case the flattening of ground, or the historical reorganising, my apologies. I, I just, you're spared the wheel of taunt, but I'm not. Okay, there we are. If you look at some of those images of the way in which very often they're devoid of people. So to come back from that historically and to move into an earlier period, if we just run through a few of those, you can see those are pictures, well-known pictures by Charles Marvel of Paris and the reorganisation of Paris, what was called the housemanisation. You flatten it, you make sure there are no corners you can't see into, you make sure there are long boulevards that come out of a centre, the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, and that way you can control people. It's the introduction of realising and dealing with large populations. About 400,000 people are displaced while this happens in the 1860s and 1870s. So you can kind of see here rail... Tra you can see the way in which industrialisation is moving. And you can also see in this image here, which is actually an Annan picture of the salt market um, from Bridgegate showing a crowd, how different this looks in terms of the number of people who are in there. So now you're looking at a little bit later and you can see that in fact the streets are not empty but they're full of crowds and they're out in the streets. And similarly, if we start to, one of the reasons I've put those in is to bring it into something that is more local trying to also get that look, sort of, as I say, beyond a local um, frame as well, but also bearing that in mind. At the same time, you also get, um, this is the guide to the panorama in Glasgow, in fact, okay, from the 1880s, and the Battle of Bannockburn. And you'll see that the name underneath it is Philip Fleischer of Munich. Okay? So that tells you something in itself of what's happening in the 19th century. And as you, say, you can see at the top, it says, Great Scottish National Panorama. National is a, a word used a lot, okay, national panorama. And this was in Sucky Hall Street, and it's uh, now the site, not surprisingly, is in nearly every major European city of the cinema. I don't know what it is these days. What the big, is the big cinema still in Sucky Hall Street? ABC. Is it the ABC now? Thank you. Um, so this is the, the panorama stood on the, on the site of the ABC. And of course, the panorama itself, as you can see, Bannockburn, when I was having a look to see what happened to the, the material here, and some of you may know this as well, some of the paintings are actually at People's Hydro, 
and they've been there for a while because of the connection to um, entertainment, entrepreneurship, hotel ownership, and they were moved there where they still are. So that idea of the way that panoramas, photography and film also suggests there's a much wider um, margin. And last, just in this, it's more to do with where we're sitting now and thinking about Glasgow too. As you can see here, Glasgow in panorama and that actually you have there um, photographs by Alan. They're actually pretty boring, but there, there's a set of photographs taken from that. So that idea that you would shift on to then getting, if you think of also the drone view as well, being able to get this wider view taken from a height. Those are some of the questions I think that are really important to think about um, of kind of photography's history. But you can see what I'm saying about um, Fleischer from uh, Munich. I'm also sort of thinking about the way in which by the 19th century you've got mass immigration into cities. And of course you've got questions about housing itself. So in this, this image is in fact from Glasgow Council Archives taken around about the turn of the century, I think it's about 19, might be about 1908 or something like that, of um, poverty, the slum clearance, the removal of all those uh, of kind of poor housing, which Alan's work was part of as well, only this is not named as a photographer, as far as I'm aware. And really what you find happening in that period is this mass migration into Glasgow. And one of the problems, I think, at the moment of thinking about how photography tells its stories is also not being aware very often of our own histories. And we know that in the 19th century, large numbers of people moved into somewhere like Glasgow or Paris or London or Liverpool and the anxiety was, what do you do with the people? Those are the questions. What do you do with the people? And what you see in Glasgow Council's um, minutes is the view that, in fact, people should be sent back. So in something like the mid-19th century, 1849, you get um, Dr. Strang saying that actually we, had to send, we must send people back. He says, the scourge of the wandering and famished Irish that we have to check this immediately, he goes on to say, and keep them at home, or if not, perhaps um, pay some money to Ireland to not let them emigrate here. And in fact, at the same time, the medical officer of health says, well, those are victims of unparalleled cruelty, he says, Mercil mercilessly stripped, sorry, mercilessly shipped off in cargoes like cattle infected with the plague and inhumanely cast ashore. Um, so that idea as well of thinking about some of the, our own histories might allow us to think, I think, more, in a more nuanced way about the present. So one of the things we know by the 19th century is that you have mass migration. Glasgow, I think, something like quadruples in size between about 1850, 1800 and 1850. I think it does the same again in about the next 25 years as well. So it's swelling populations and the questions of some of the things around housing of what to do with that. And I think also, in just in so thinking more wi widely about that in Europe as well, those are questions that keep returning to us. So this image here, and I, I'm not going to say a lot about Edith Tudor Hart's work, but I'm partly thinking about the way in which that idea of national, if you think about Fleischmann and his panorama in the 1880s and 1890s in Glasgow, Tudor Hart, uh, Austrian comes to Britain in the 1930s. Um, she photographs at home housing conditions in Vienna. She contrasts it with um, life in cafes, kind of view that we have, emancipated women uh, out on their own for the first time. Like many emigres, um, she's forced to leave Austria. And here you have the shadow of, as it were, fascism falling over Austria with the swastikas in uh, the window. And I think one of the points really about this is the way in which um, we can use those images to think about questions of um, migration. I'm, go I'm going to come back to this question a little bit further on as well. Because I, if I think about 1939, say, I think that's a useful year to look at and what's happening in that period. And also in some of her work here of, you know, the new woman. This is a montage of um, Tudor Hart's work. She comes to Britain, she's deported, she actually marries um, an English doctor as a way of coming back here. Uh, she's later suspected of being a spy and so on. But all those things tell us a lot about how people are trying to use photographs to imagine the future. And also in this image here, this is actually a picture of uh, Paul Robeson. 
and um, a sculptor, I forgot her first name, Brilliant, I think it's Eva Brilliant, um, making, you can see here, the clay, the clay sculpture. I partly wanted to put this in because I also noticed that, in fact, Robson came to Glasgow in 1960 to lead the May Day Parade. And if you're interested, go online and look at the, there's a little segment of Pathé News um, around that. So one of the questions that also raise is about those issues of class and race. Tudor Hart was Jewish, and of course that's one of the reasons she's forced um, to leave. But when she comes here, she makes a lot of work really about uh, women, and here you can, you can see in the picture uh, working class wives with her uh, photograph on the cover. Uh, you see a more romanticised, that book is from, I uh, think, 19, uh, sort of late 30s, um, the one below was, re, it was reprinted in the late 70s, and of course it's a very romanticised, not modernist view of what's, uh, of what's there. And the poster on the, the, the right, as you can see, is a side gallery poster where they use the kind of modernist design to show her work. And Tudor Hart's last work uh, that she did is this one here, which is for picture post, The Atom Age. Um, and after this point, it, you know, it was kind of, you know, um, dawn or dusk was the title of the article inside. After this point, she was asked not to actually make any more work. She didn't make any work after this, after the early 50s. That was the end of it, partly because of her connection to communism. Um, and similarly, in this picture here, where you don't necessarily, I suppose, have to be able to read at all, but the anxiety that there was post-war. What this demonstrates is the way in which um, there's the fear that people are going to, there's going to be revolt. This is 1946. She might be involved in this as a communist agitator. They're collecting coal. People are squatting in buildings. There's another crisis coming. So those questions would seem to keep repeating themselves. And similarly, in this image here, this again was made uh, for the government. And one of the reasons I wanted to put both the, the fact that she worked for the weeklies, this is from a book called Moving and Growing, which was about physical education in primary schools. And one of the reasons I wanted to, to use this was to look at the way in which children are kind of thought about, the future of what children will be like. And it was Tudor Hart's view that actually young people should use a camera for more than just snapshotting, as she called it, that they should take an active part in the life of the nation. So, of course, one of the things I'm really saying here is that those um, refugees, migrants, very often were trying to build a national identity for this country, and a great deal of that was done through photography. Um, and I think that's, that's important to remember when we talk about some kind of identity. And one of the problems with a national identity is quite simply it can be very useful for building a sense of um, kind of collective endeavour. But once it's built, it's used as a way of excluding others and it becomes normative. History would tell us that that identity is actually very different. It's much more multiple. And so that has also, I think, more recently set me off thinking about um, kind of phot photographic history. And one of the reasons in this country, I mean, Helmut Gernsheim and Alison Gernsheim, who, have, uh, who produced a whole number of books, this is the first one that uh, Gernsheim produced. He was interned um, during the war and sent to Australia. And he got back uh, by doing photographs of bombed out London. And just thinking, I've just put together there some of the covers of the books that they both produced. But I'm kind of curious about why there's been so little written about um, their contribution to British post-war photographic history. Okay? Again, uh, Gernsheim was a refugee, part Jewish, came from Munich, found it very hard to fit in, never fitted in here to the establishment, was never accepted, collected widely, worked in books with his wife, who did m much of the research and a great deal of the writing. But, I mean, I sometimes wonder, you can see in this in the far um, right-hand side, the, those impossible English, which he did with Quentin Bell. He never, that in itself might have rubbed people the wrong way, but he could never fit in. And in fact, when he tried to develop and build uh, a, a national photographic um, gallery, got nowhere. 
no one would take his collection because he was attached to it and it ended up um, going to the States, in fact, where it, where it still is. And looking at some of those um, images, those you can see, that's Alison in the background. In all the pictures, as far as I can find, it tends to be this arrangement. It's either Gerns Hymans or, or she's in the background. Um, or in this one, I think, which might be near the truth, he appears to be almost standing in her shoulders because when you start to look at the work, she did a lot of the writing. There was no question of that and revising. But jointly, they started to write very widely about um, photographic history in all its forms. There's a lot of stuff to do with commercial, there's much stuff to do with fashion, things which, you know, at the time, I think were probably quite important in terms of developing some idea of what photography um, would be. Okay, so just watch my time because I don't want to go on too long. Um, if we just pause there for a second and then, as I say, that be so 1939, if you, t if you think about that, 1839, the kind of war years and slightly beyond that, um, and then into, um, as I said to you, when I thought, okay, what would be the next stage where things might change again in 1989? And there was a sea change coming by then in a number of ways. Um, first of all, you may recognise some of this work. This is actually Joe Spence's work from one of her uh, exhibitions in the early 80s called The Picture of Health. And you can see, as I say, a kind of uh, way in which it uses snapshots. When you put it together, it says, how do I begin to take responsibility for, um, you know, in that sense, for my body? Um, and it's no mistake that if you're able to see it from, from further back, that body is actually written across her arse. Okay, that that idea that there's a different that eye in her head. So that you know those two extremes, as it were, of you know eye and body. The idea that I think therefore I am that it's all, but actually in the end your body gives up on you. And I wanted to put this in because when that this exhibition toured, it was actually laminated, very cheaply produced forms. And one of the things is, as you can see, this is a very cleaned up version of it. And the idea was that this would tour around community groups as indeed it did, um, and it did in the early 80s. You can see here I've, I've put in a number of slides just together. Um, you know, in the bottom, uh, the miners' strike, hugely um, you know, kind of, uh, I suppose, influential in what happened beyond that point. Brixton riots on the top left. On the right, those are women who became very heavily involved in the miners' strike as well. And when the strike was going on in those areas, Spence's work was touring the northeast in community centres. That's where it was going. It wasn't designed for galleries. It was going into that. And similarly, if you look at other work coming out in the 80s, Chris Killip's book, In Flagrante, um, about working class life and really about Thatcherism, you know, the idea of a terrible misdeed, a terrible injustice, um, was being, the, you know, that book became a very important book, thinking about um, those issues of class and race. And you can see those have been really since, you know, 1839, photography has been part of those debates about class and race. Or in this image here, um, again from Killip's book. But of course, there's then lots of other people working in that area as well. And I've put in a couple here from a photographer called Tish Murtha, who also worked in Newcastle in the northeast. Um, uh, in this image here, youth unemployment, again. And one of the reasons I wanted to put in um, this work was quite simply because Tish Murtha came from Newcastle. Uh, Chris Killip lived in Newcastle and lived there for quite a long time. And she was an insider. She was one of 10 children living in a rough area of Newcastle. She went to Newport to study documentary. But I don't know if any of you saw recently in The Guardian this picture. I don't know if any of you follow the page where they find the people in the picture. But the boy ju jumping out the window is actually T Tish Murtha's um, brother. And he talks about jumping out the window, um, about them growing up in Benwell and Newcastle, and about what's happened to the various people in the picture as well. So. Within every, if you think of something like in Flagranti, there's a whole other set of work, again, beyond the margins of that. 
And of course, that's the other thing to think about, what's not, because the same images are repeated and repeated. And similarly, from looking at questions of migration and exile, that's important too to think about the way that people actually move. So in trying to sketch very quickly a picture of the 1980s, you can see the kind of debates around, um, you know, that are emerging, also around feminism with Joe Spence. But Spence was very aware of class as an issue, hugely aware of class as an issue, hence her campaigning role. Also, I put in here the Kodak colour tins, which those of you who are older will remember, where Kodak tried to boost their sales, not with much success, by, by making furry creatures called Snap, Zoom, Flash, can't remember what the other ones are. And there's a small trade, I notice, on eBay on the Colourkins, who still seem to be around. But that tells us something. If you think back to Seuss Brothers and that way of marketing, um, you know, fancy goods and small, you know, sort of that, that to think of photography part, as part of that, I think, is quite important. And lastly, um, the Art of Photography, which appeared in 1989 at the Royal Academy. Now, I wanted to put this in for a number of reasons. One is, it was the first photographic exhibition that really got into an art, a major art um, venue. The Royal Academy is big. So here we have photography. It was a huge blockbuster um, exhibition. And, of course, it's a it's portrait of a tearful woman by Man Ray, uh, made in the 1930s on the cover, a very lovely image. Um, looking up, you know, that idea of it's sort of very appealing in all sorts of ways. But the reality of that exhibition was that there were only three women photographers represented in it. It's a huge exhibition. And it, it, the photographers represented, well, you can probably work them out, were um, Julia Margaret Cameron, Susan Mycellus, and Cindy Sherman. Okay, now that's quite interesting. So, you know, that, that was it. No other women photographer, this is 1989, um, are represented within it. So maybe women at that point felt they did have reason to be tearful about what had happened. Um, and similarly, if you look at somebody like Mycelis' work, again, who's done all sorts of projects, I, put, I think I put this in partly to think about the way in which it's all written around as well. You know, it's not the pristine edge of photographs. This is actually from her own website where she puts in some of the leaves. She tries to give things a feel of what it would be to, to see what she's doing with photographs rather than just um, the pristine images. OK, so those kind of questions are shifting. You can see then there's a kind of social shift uh, beginning to happen in photography. And again, as a kind of again snapshot of that, if we bring that up to um, the, the present, then this is Dana Popa's work. Again, I'm looking at things you can see here, which is sort of to do with migration. So with da Dana Popa, uh, Popa's work, um, you can kind of see the way in which this is a work around uh, sex trafficking and migration. And you can see that this then becomes, if you look at this image here, of a girl, it's called Not Natasha, um, the prostitutes hate to be called Natasha that she meets. She goes back to uh, uh, Moldova. She goes around looking at how people's lives have been changed by the need to actually move away in order to survive. So one of the questions I suppose I want to um, not quite end with, but sort of, again, sort of frame up a little bit, is the way in which, in terms of people moving, migrating, is a history from the 19th century just as photography does in that um, Morissette print as well. It goes everywhere. So do people. And the reason, of course, people move have always been the same, which is subsistence, i.e. they've got to make money to live, and political liberty. That has not changed. That has remained absolutely the same. And therefore, really, one of the arguments about the way in which refugees are always people, as it were, I suppose, um, fleeing a wasteland that is a kind of uh, economic equivalent of a scorched earth strategy. If you think back to the drone plane, um, the Gorgon Stair, the reapers that go out and just flatten areas, then it's partly, that, that's the same kind of thing that's happening. It happened in the 19th century because of industrialization, and it's happening again now. And so trying to actually map some of those um, ways, this in a very small way, 
and I've, um, that I'm doing it because, you know, if you think of something like Popa's work, again, she talks about those two girls who are, who are very young, who have been trafficked as well. Um, it's a way of thinking about um, how people are regulated, how they have to move, um, and the way in which globalisation has shifted everything. In fact, it is really forced migration. And those are questions that we definitely want to think about um, to do with the present. Okay, so again, if I just, I'm, I'm going to just pause here in this image. This is in fact an, a, a recent image. This is Palestinian refugees in Yarmouk um, earlier this month, in fact, uh, just taken. And you can see here the huge crowds. This place is flattened. People are, in fact, here in this image, queuing for food parcels. Now, all of those might seem a very long way from where we started off. But I would argue with you that that's actually, when you look at that Morrissey print, once you start to move out, once you start to think diachronically and longitudinally, that's actually what you're talking about. Photography is an industrial medium, and it's part of the history of industrialisation and post-industrialisation. Um, as we might call it. And that maybe brings me on to the final kind of things I want to say, because in thinking about those dates, as I said, looking at that kind of speeding up of things, I want to make an argument really of why history matters and why anybody making a photograph should study history. And I'm so sort of grateful to SHOP for asking me to do this because it made me think about my own position in why, you know, if somebody say to me, why would you bother about this sort of information? Why wouldn't you just tell the story of the great photographs that, that exist, or just about art? Or if you want to write just about science, or whatever, or mass culture, why bring all of those things into play? Well, I think that history offers us a distinctive way about thinking about the world, and so does photography. Photography definitely offers us that. It teaches us to think both as kind of a slice through time, as say this image is, or to be able to think more widely and sort of wide angle. And it teaches us that everything has a history, and that includes ourselves. Photographs are simply congealed moments that are caught in a far longer historical, um, cultural, political, economic trajectory. That makes it harder to talk about them, but that's all to the good. It shows us that, in fact, people and events are situated within processes that unfold. They are not fixed. And it teaches us, I think, how to think about, decode, contextualise, compare images, to critically evaluate them and also how to interpret them. And that allows us to think about our own positions in the present and its relationship to the past. Photographs and history, I think, can teach us um, to ask questions. And it was Alan Sekula who, um, whose, whose view it was that a photograph, he said, is always worth a thousand questions. Okay? It's not worth a thousand words, it's worth a thousand questions. And that would actually allow us to actually uh, refuse naive theories of linear progress or of inevitability and gives us vantage points from which to consider the present. Okay, so I think that idea, if you think back to the Zeus image at the beginning, then you know, that's what those vantage points are about. That's what he's trying to do in that. So this might allow us to think about photographs less as objects and more as historical events. Photographs are history. They're not illustrations of it any longer. And in that sense, as Benjamin was fond of repeating and that bears repeating, every single image of the past that isn't claimed by the present as one of its own threatens to disappear. And his view was that could be irretrievable as well. We have to make that, as it were, judgment call. What is lost may well never ever be found. And so in that sense, the meaning of a photograph matters because it belongs to the future as much as it belongs to the past. The idea that it can just be consigned to the past, they don't, they belong to the kind of future. The photograph's frame simply marks a provisional limit. It points beyond it. And in fact, it points to margins that are much wider than we could ever possibly imagined. There's no way a photograph can actually capture 
um, all the multitude of real life phenomena that lie beyond it. The question I think is then, how is it that we might expand those parameters or margins or frames or whatever you would like to call them? And actually, I say that because I think there's an increasingly myopic look at what photography is. And in that sense, modernity, whether you want to call it late, liquid, post, although I would caution people about post, as long as you, in fact, you've got to remember that post means um, after, but does not mean beyond, necessarily. What we find is, if you think about that question, think of, I prefer, I think, liquid or late, is that, in fact, we're still trying to wrestle with the questions that we arrived with in the 19th century and photography arrived with, and that is how to deal with the people. That's what Maurice says image is, is about, I think, as well, how to deal um, with the people. Okay, so, finally, the survival of photography, I think, as part of the arts and humanities, does very much depend on a broad recognition of photography's value um, for democracy. Okay, so this is that, I, I think, coming back to thinking, as I say, right, almost sort of in a circular way, that's really where its value lies. And the survival of democracy depends on how people are educated for it. So if I bring this right up to the present, one of the things I'm thinking, I think, in the back of my mind is that the neoliberalisation of culture generally um, means that we get increasingly narrow looks. So if we think about, you know, what I would argue with you is if you think about photography as part of education, then in that sense... What we seem to have, it seems more and more, is vocationally led programmes, um, which become increasingly attractive to what might be called a business community. It's interesting that business is now called a community. If you think back to something like um, Chris Killip's work or Tish Murtha's work, Tish Murtha's work was very much a view from inside, that was the community then. The rhetoric that we now have of creative industries um, with professional or industry-facing um, uh, study or programmes ready to produce employment, um, in what are called employment-ready students, I think discourages really serious thinking about questions of class or race or gender, although probably less so these days. Um, and if you think this is not the case, go on and look at something like Skillset's website and look at the appalling statistics for the number of black and ethnic minorities involved in um, the creative industries. The statistics are there for people to see. They're just not published um, or not widely distributed. What I think really ha has happened is that there's been less uh, discussion about the way in which education is not more democratic. We're sold it on that basis. Um, precious little discussion about the way in which it's debt financed, or indeed that servicing debt really is a form of wage theft. That's what many of those pictures from the 19th century are also about. And of course, the other problem that we have, I think, is that in the free market of ideas, everyone gets to express an opinion, no matter how in uninformed or indeed ignorant. That's, that's, that's presented to as a good thing. But of course, we actually know um, that the market of ideas, like any market, is not free. It is heavily regulated. So, the net result of all of this, I think, is a collapse in the faith, um, of, uh, sorry, a collapse of faith in the power of knowledge, reason, and most importantly of all, will. All of this dampens um, desire for democracy. There's no question of that. And so it reduces our participation in it. And in that sense, as we now know, um, really what, uh, what happens once politics becomes economised is that you have a kind of uh, re-emergence of a kind of oligarchy. And Annie and I were, sp Annie was telling me as I came in this evening about that Trump's now got, is now the nominee, which I hadn't, I hadn't heard. And that's a good example of really what happens once people, you know, a democracy where there isn't full popular participation is an oligarchy. That's what we have that's probably coming in our direction too. And we have to be very careful about that. And that's the question about people being educated to participate in it. And so I think in those questions, those questions would take us full circle 
to the way in which, if we'd return right to the beginning, in France it was the country that drafted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which only 50 years after that, 1789, then you get the emergence of photography, which is bought by the state, freely available to everybody. And one of the things about the great things about photography is, in both its mimetic, I think, and its political sense, that's what representation is. Um, and so I would say to you at the end of this that really what we have is a struggle, not only over meaning, but over value. We should struggle over meanings. We should fight for them. And fighting, I think, today in the visual arena is inseparable from any other kind of struggle in the political arena as well. The pictures that we have, the picture we have of the world really matters. It matters enormously to who we are, um, what we want to become, what our world is like, and most importantly of all, and not least, what we do, which is, of course, the final arbiter um, of, of um, you know, any philosophy whatsoever. So I shall probably actually go not rather, I'm just going up slightly over, but I, I shall end on stick fighting in Paisley from the 1880s. Now, I haven't seen this picture for a long time, and it amused me to find it actually on a marital, uh, sorry, a marital, a martial arts, <laughs> a, a martial arts website um, from somebody from Paisley has put it up, um, saying that they found this. He said, that, so they, all it says is, this is taken by a plumber, <laughs> it says. And um, I, I thought that just in that sense of stick fighting in the 19th century. So, yeah, people should fight and argue more about the value of images. And we certainly should fight for a much wider historical, nuanced um, understanding of what photography is and can be. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, all those. Rebecca, do you think there was a golden time, a golden decade of uh, informed photography and informed photography teaching? No, there, there's no golden. There's no golden age. I don't. I don't, I don't think that's. I, I certainly do not think there's a golden age. I think. Um, I, I think what's often been interesting looking back is that moments of economic restructuring, various things happen, but none of them are golden. What they, what, what they tended to do was to shift debates. Um, and I think, I think what has been underplayed is the contribution of others to those histories, if there's, if there's one thing that would, that would go through that. But very quickly, it becomes absorbed, and that's one of the points about identity. And one of the reasons, actually, I didn't say anything also about, really about feminism, because, again, feminism, uh, you know, it formed an identity, but that can very quickly become a way, once it's formed, of actually using it to exclude others from it. And you have to be careful about that, unless you see it's a kind of politics of radical democracy. I suppose when I was thinking of really, sorry, just to carry on a little bit, uh, when you think of the 1970s mm. and the quite revolutionary teachings at PCL and so mm -hmm. on, uh, people like John Tagg and Victor Bergen and Alan Zakula, who you mentioned, um, and, and you know, talk of photographic artists like Joe Spence and, and, and you know, that, that, sort of, that sort of era, it just seems from my perspective that looking back on that, there's very little rigorous uh, photographic criticism that's taking this place. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, that's a, I think, I think that's, that's a fair point. There was an upsurge in theory. The net result of that, of course, many people said, was that that was a, a, a kind of result of the crisis in theory. And in fact, one of the problems was there wasn't enough work being made. Maybe that was a necessary step. I certainly think what was different around the Polytechnic movement, probably when you say Sekula in the States as well, 
in terms of those kind of community colleges was that the idea of the, the polytechnics was that those were places in which you would a actively debate the value of education. And that's probably what's changed, and that's to do with, I think, probably economic restructuring. But it, whether you would call it a gold, maybe I'm just hesitant of golden age, uh, ages, because... And also, when you, the other thing that's interesting, when you look at who's included and who's excluded from those golden ages too, that's quite interesting. I mean, Spence enjoyed very, very little recognition. I think paid a very high price for you know, the, the work that she made. But she was, as I say, it's important to remember that work was made for community shows. It was about how to look after yourself. It was about issues of health care. Um, so I think, I think those things are quite complicated. Um, but I certainly think that idea about debating what it, what it is, what, what is the value of, you know, what, what, what is it you would need to know? How do you maybe think about what it is you make and do? Um, has, has, again, shifted slightly. I think probably, I, I think some of that is to do with technological shifts too. Um, but I don't know, other people might think differently. Well, I, I mean, one, one of the arguments was in the 1920s, it was, it was Siegfried Krakauer who said that there was a flood. He called the, the, the exponential increase in photographs a flood and a blizzard of images. So there was the same kind of feeling then. And I think the other, most images that we have just now, they are the same. What is that, that's the thing that's worth it. It's the repetition of the same kind of... So th there are lots of images. So if you go on to look at you know, this kind of stuff that's uploaded, they're all the same. Um, now, whether or not you say, well, do we want to, we can certainly store those images, but you could easily, I mean, the Google use of images, picture, the way that picture research is being done actually cuts you off from the wider range. I think that's the problem. And maybe it's, it's not so much um, that all those images need to be saved, because the way that we use cameras is entirely exactly. different. Yeah. Um, and I think more, that, that's a bit where we're going back to, you know, I, I can see what your idea of a golden age was, that somehow they're, they're thinking about history and theory and practice together. That, I, that one of the reasons I think I ended where I did was to do with the sense at which we actually need to think pretty deeply about why it is we're shooting those images all the time. Um, what is it about, you know, in that, that, that sense? It, it's almost as if that's the more important, pictures or it didn't happen. You have to have your profile constantly seen. It's almost got nothing to do with the images. It might mean stepping back. I don't know. Because there was, I mean, I, th I think that's what, what Robin knew as well. There was a time when you thought you could have a grasp, roughly, of what was going on in history. history and now it's like, you know, well, it's flood, flood, it's just, it's gone, you see. Well, I think that's when you maybe do turn to historically. To, to, to think about, okay, this in one way isn't, um, in one way isn't new. It's happened, you know, that, that was the anxiety. If you think about, you know, technological revolutions, whether or not it was Kodak cameras or whether or not it was, um, you know, Leica's coming in or, you know, in that sense that it would all be, you know, it would just be too many images. To, maybe it's not that. Maybe it need, needs a different way of looking at it. But I don't think it means... I don't think it means that you can't have a grasp on it. I think that's our duty almost to do that. Yeah, there aren't any easy answers, but, you know, there's plenty of difficult questions to be asked, and those are probably worth asking. Um, and I do think that some of the, you know, 
some of the problems have been to do with um, actually not filling in bits of history from the wider margins in all sorts of, you know, the democratic deficit, as it's called, definitely that would be true. And that's true of images as well, or understanding that our own histories are much more complex than we're ever led to believe. Of course, there's, there's a totally vested interest in getting you to just load up the same image all the time. Same poses, same kind of things. You don't have to do it. I think it's a, I mean, I, I, very much so. I mean, the idea that a picture changes everything is just nonsense. And you'll remember that that was said quite recently in the image of the child, the very small child who was washed up on the beach with the Turkish soldier. Um, did it change anything? I mean, the other thing, there's lots of things, again, you could fit, 1989 is the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. And at that point, America didn't sign up to the rights of the child either, nor have they ratified it now. I mean, so when you start to look at those things, um, those pictures in themselves are not. What might, I think, actually, is people understanding their own histories and that we too are part of that, because the problem is to see them over there, keep them over there, as you know, I said about you know, kind of the a Strang's view about just send the Irish back, let them wander around in Glasgow. That that was the main immigration in the 19th century. By later, it was a lot of uh, Jewish refugees as well. So I think that uh, what I would argue is that we don't need the extreme. It's more thinking, actually understanding one, you know, actually what's happening at a local level. That we too have those histories. They're not other histories. Um, and I think those pictures don't. People just look at them, and, as they always have done, and turn the page. It's very easy to do. No, I think that's a fair point as well, that people, there still, there still is, and I, I mean, again, yeah, there still is a trade in that. N war is, I think, quite particular. Well, somebody, somebody in the audience must have an answer to that. Uh, uh, sadly, I don't. <laughs>
same question I'm trying to formulate in my mind is that uh, I'm no expert on the history of photography, but as I sort of look at it as a sort of casual amateur, um, it seems to me that there's a great deal of interpretation or reinterpretation of photography um, by people decades after the photograph had been taken. Um, but the thing that really interests me about photography, that, that, that I find interesting mm -hmm. about photography, is, is what motivated the person. What were the thoughts in the mind of the person mm -hmm. who was doing the photograph at the time? And which is what I think you're talking about. And when I ask photographers, if they show me a photograph, I often mm -hmm. ask them, and they say, so what, what, what was it? What was the, 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 the thought immediately prior to you thinking I'm going to make a photograph of this thing that I've just seen? And, um, uh, and, you know, and, why, and then you, you can ask follow-up questions about why did you take it in that particular way and why did you mm. put it in and what, and what, you, what, what you're hoping that you get out of it and achieve by doing it. And quite often photographers that I ask they can't give me a very well thought mm. out explanation for that process. Mm. Now I'm very conscious of in most of the, the in most of the photographs that I've taken, I, I, I could tell you what the process was that I went through and, and I mean I'm not saying it will end up as a great photograph, but it's what I was thinking about. And, and I'm I sort of worry when we're talking about the history of photography, do we do we actually get down to what the motivation was of the mm -hmm. photographer? Or rather, you know, as we set ourselves up to reinterpret that, put ideas into the photographer's head? I don't know. Mm -hmm. is, that, is this something that there's a, a thought about in generally in the world, world of history of photography? I don't know. Well, I mean, there, there are. Very often photographers have written about, not all, but a lot of photographers do write about what they we're doing, what they think they're doing, and that's certainly an important part of understanding. But of course, it's not the only part of that. And you're right in a way, sometimes people won't. And it's a bit like language, you know, you, you need a feel for you. So, so that idea, you might have a feel, but you might not know what it is you're doing. And actually, I'm not even sure it's that different from history. I mean, I really do think history is an ad hoc, post hoc kind of business. You do it, and then you name it. You know, you, you sort of work your way towards it. And I think for photographers, as far as I understand it, it's very often the same. Um, you I, I think this is what comes down to, um, or partly what I was asking about to about doing their own, about this sort of open age, uh, and part of why photographic education and visual literacy is so important to me. Uh, as a, um, in order to be visually literate, rather than just to craft a picture and make money out of it, although there's a certain amount of visual literacy, of course, that is required for that as well. But it's the idea that within uh, you know, a photographic critique situation, and you, you, you're sitting down with uh, you know, adults, young adults or whatever, and you're showing a picture and you say, right, what's it about? You know, um, and it, it's, that's quite different to what is a picture of, or what's it about? And if you want to interrogate this notion, of what am I trying to say? What am I trying to communicate? Who am I trying to communicate to? Because that's part of putting up the education. The whole, as it were, and pardon me, uh, uh, the whole amateur Facebook, post your landscape, take a picture of the this sort of thing, has got nothing to do with what it's Unless you perhaps think about it at a later time, an hour later, or a day later, or 10 years later, you can say, ah, I see now what I was doing intuitively actually means something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's also going back. Maybe it's also the idea of thinking back to your question about the breakfast is that you can see everything. Of course, you can't see everything, and there is an argument that the more instruments you have, you know, to hear better, see better, the worse your own abilities become at sharpening your vision, your voice, your hearing. And I think that 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 might be one of the things. But it's not, you know, you know, any. It's an image. It's an, this kind of, you know, you've got to picture picture everything. 
or it didn't happen. You have to have evidence. So in a funny kind of way, it's if you internalise all the machinery that was used as surveillance, only now you're turning it on yourself. You've got this, in, in, you go back to your, you know, this inventory, um, which is not really going to be a lot of use to anyone. And it's also a bit like food isn't for eating. That's the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, you know, you just... Yeah. That's the least of it. That's the least of it. How does it look? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But I think you're right about how, how it is you give, you give people a voice. And also, one of the things I was thinking about, Tish Murtha, you're right about Amber and about Side and those kind of, you know, they were really commu long term commitments to those communities for the people who went. Yeah. And they, they, they haven't, although they've always had complex funding structures, which are interesting too. But I think the thing also, I wanted to put in Tish Murtha's work because. Of course, I do wonder about, in terms of people now going on from inside of those communities, to be able to go back to those communities and give voice to them, how possible that actually is. I think it's very, very difficult now to do that. I think that was a particular moment as well. I'm going back to, you know, not, not what I would call a golden age, but that idea about the opening up of education post-war. Um, the 1944 Education Act is key is key about access to education. Um, and that's also you know, the reason I was interested in Tudor Hart's work. A lot of that's about children and about education as well. You know, her view that you had to have people who were, um, you, know, who, uh, you know, actually thought there were great things to be done in the world and you would give them the means to do that. Uh, and I think Amber is very interesting in that, that respect. And I would like to see more of the wider work coming out too. I mean, you know, one could talk on about Killip and also, you know, whether that, that work was a golden age work for him in some ways, because, of course, he hasn't really made anything since. Or nothing of any Nothing of any, yeah, 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 yeah. But, yes, in terms of wider archives, giving voice to a wider rate, you know, but, you know, communities, I think it's hugely important. I mean, I want to get No, I think, I think that's true, and I think things, I mean, the, the other thing, although I, 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 I touched on, although maybe didn't say in any detail, is, of course, the huge um, difference that there has been in terms of um, wage, you know, the kind of holding down of wages since, really, probably the early 80s is huge. You know, in fact, the, the impact, really, of conservatism followed by new labour, huge, just in terms of people's ability to do other things. Um, for, for most not all I mean one of the ironies of globalisation is that those who have least are expected to pay for everything um, and I think that's very different from the period you're talking about I think it's about economically a very particular period because if you think about it those that, the, the day, you know, when you're talking about those are the people who benefited from the post-war shifts in education
Thank you very much, and I mean, thank you very much for coming. And also, can I thank Isolt and John for setting me up? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.